Hydropower is a very basic and simple concept, taking the, the power of flowing water and turning it into energy. Hydropower was originally started to be used around 0 AD, um, actually, for mills and for farming applications. Hydropower began to grow rapidly from the 1900s, but the big development in the United States was in the 1930s. The Hoover Dam and the Grand Coulee Dams were built. Hydropower has always been one of the lowest cost, long-term forms of power in the world. The desire for low cost, reliable power has really been the driver for hydropower. To build a hydropower project, it's really done in separate phases. The, one of the very first phases is you need to divert the water. So normally you build a set of tunnels that you divert the, the river through short term so you can get into the bottom of the river and, and build the dam across the river. But the water flow continues because you don't want the water level to start rising. With the river diverted, engineers can clear the bedrock ready to build the massive concrete dam structure. The water flow can then be returned to the dam and the reservoir allowed to fill. The hydroelectric facility can be built after the dam is completed. Once the foundations are built, the turbines themselves are constructed on site and installed. The remaining structure is built around them. In a hydro scheme, the water comes through the intakes in the upper part of the dam and then is fed down through the penstock pipes and then flows down into wicket gates which control the flow into the turbine. The moving element of the turbine is connected by a shaft to the electrical generator. Ну а уже когда генератор вырабатывает электрическую энергию по линиям электропередачи эта энергия уходит потребителю. Ну и в общем здесь вот процесс преобразования заканчивается. In a hydro scheme, the dams provide the elevation for the waterhead to drive the turbines. Water elevation is crucial in determining the amount of power a hydroelectric plant can generate. The higher the water level, the higher the resulting water pressure that can be fed through the turbines. This difference between the upper and lower part of the dam is called water flow pressure. With over 100 hydropower stations currently operating, Russia is one of the biggest producers of hydropower in the world, ranking second for hydropower resources. But this wasn't always the case. The country's hydropower industry halted during industry reforms in the 1990s, but regained momentum in 2004 when the government considered new ways to create economic growth by utilizing untapped resources. One of those underutilized regions is in the eastern part of Siberia. The Cyanoshishkinshaya project is located in the Siberian region of Russia. It's one of three large hydropower plants in the region. In the location of this project, there are some very large rivers. Therefore, it's quite uh, convenient to build a dam at this location. The reason for building this dam was to supply the aluminium industry. 70% of the load on the Eastern Siberian energy grid consists of four large aluminum smelters. Aluminum smelting is a chemical process of extracting aluminum from its oxide, alumina. Smelters tend to be located close to large power stations since they utilize a lot of electricity. Any standard hydropower plant really composes of four main elements. You must have a dam to, to impound the water and hold the water back. Um, two, you must have a hydropower station. Third component is a substation or, or transmission line to interconnect the plant to the load or to the power grid. And, and the fourth, all the environmental considerations that come along with building one of the plants. The first unit went online in the late 70s. There's 10 turbines in the project the last unit going on in the late 80s, about 10 years after the first unit went online. A Francis turbine, it runs very smooth at about 60% power up to about 100% power. Usually in the 90% power range is where it really runs very smooth. But there is a rough zone that occurs between about 40 to 60% power range. It vibrates a lot. Basically, a vortex forms under the turbine, and the vortex is violent enough that it is able to make the entire load bounce up and down. 
So for Francis turbines, we generally try to get through that rough zone and the vortex zone as fast as we can. The plant, is its rated condition is 6,400 megawatts. 6,000 megawatts is enough to power some small countries, medium-sized countries, actually. Power is the only commodity in the world that has to be in perfect balance. Supply and demand has to be matched almost perfect within a couple of seconds. In 2002, improvements were made to the quality of grid frequency control due to fluctuating smelter loads and to permit interconnection with other adjacent power grids. A sister project had a fire in the days before. And when the other project had the fire, they put more of a load, a regulating load, on Sayano Shushkinskaya unit. During the night on August 16th, Sayano Shushkinskaya experienced large and rapid load swings. Unit two at the plant had been set as the lead unit. You have to go through the rough zone every time you start and stop a Francis turbine. In the rough zone, I, I've described it like being in a low-grade earthquake. That's how much the whole foundation will move. At the lower parts of, of the turbine, there's a pressure-containing part that bolts onto the concrete that's called the head cover. It's about roughly a 10-meter diameter circle in this case, holding back almost 200 meters of pressure. На крышке турбины есть такие болты, ну их шпильки называют. Значит, от вибрации они ослабевают. Не всегда это можно как бы невооруженным глазом увидеть. То есть появляются трещины. Just a few hours later, at 8.13 a.m., Unit 2 experienced a load rejection, which was followed immediately by a loud bang heard in the control building adjacent to the powerhouse. Unit 2 essentially ejected 1,900 tons of steel um, into the air, allowing a, a jet of water to shoot straight up through the roof of, of the power facility. Seconds after the geyser blew off the roof, Another very loud bang was heard downstream from the powerhouse. The enormous weight destroyed the building itself and caused massive structural damage. Instantly, the water inundated the turbine hall, rushing in at a speed of 67,600 gallons per second. Equipment engineers immediately turned their attention to the Unit 2 wicket gates. This water then came in and began to short out some of the other electrical issues. You would normally just shut the gates, but because of the incoming water, they struggled to do that. And then they lost electrical power and were unable to shut the turbines down. The only option was to manually close the water intake gates, but with no power supply to the elevators, the only way to get to the top of the dam was to climb up the stairs. On the morning of August 17th, a turbine at the Sayano Shushenskaya hydroelectric power station in southern Siberia burst apart, sending rocks, metal, and over 67,000 gallons of icy water through the turbine hall. As water poured into the hall, the plant's automatic safety system should have shut down the turbines and closed the intake gates. But turbines 7 and 9 were still operating at full speed. As the water rose at the crest of the dam, a few employees attempted to manually close the intake gates. The hero of the day was the team that went up and walked up the stairs to the upper dam and were manually able to release the gates and shut off the flow of water to, to Unit 2. At over 780 feet tall, it took the workers 18 minutes to reach the top of the dam and to begin closing the gates. It took over an hour and 10 minutes before they could close the first gate. And I, the reports I indicate another 40 minutes to get the other nine units closed after that. By 11 a.m., workers had managed to successfully close the dam's intake gates and open bypass channels that allow water to pass from the top to the bottom of the dam safely. If the gates had remained opened, the water would have continued to flow building up behind the dam until it enveloped the dam or destroyed it entirely. Meanwhile, water continued to pour into the turbine hall, flooding its lower levels and eventually submerging other turbines. In the wake of the disaster, rescue crews searched for survivors 
and removed 177,000 cubic feet of debris. 14 survivors were pulled from the wreckage. По-моему, двух или трех человек, которые были в, в нижних помещениях, и просто чудом они остались живы. То есть вот. Э... Действительно, такой э, очень болезненный момент для отечественной гидроэнергетики, таких крупных аварий. But tragically, 75 people, those trapped in the turbine hall and in the flooded rooms below, didn't make it out alive. Immediately after the accident, an investigation was launched. In hydropower, minimal amounts of maintenance is required. Some turbines have been running for decades without maintenance. I've been in machines built in the 20s that have never been apart their entire lives. They've been running almost 100 years and keep running. Provided the turbines are properly lubricated, they run normally without too much problem. They are so reliable that they begun to get taken for granted a little bit. The design life of the turbines were originally between 30 to 40 years, typically. What we've seen is closer to 30 years on these machines. Since um, the turbine was installed in 1979, turbine two suffered from uh, vibrations. У него, понимаете, была повышенная вибрация. Она была изначально. Вот его старались использовать не так часто. Допуски не стали позволять его эксплуатировать, и он стоял как раз уже на замену. So to prevent the vibrations, you have to make sure that the moving parts, the rotor, is perfectly in balance. But it's quite difficult in the, such a big piece of equipment. But one of the key variables is how many starts and stops and how many times they go through those rough zones over the course of their life. The way that the plant is being run is a contributing factor that will shorten the life. And the type of frequency control and regulation control that Sayano Shishkanchaya was doing and Unit 2 was doing definitely will, will shorten its life. It's a more intense, abusive operating regime. На самом деле это было опасно, так как он показатели у него были не лучшие, и это констатировали все комиссии. Unit 2 was experiencing high levels of vibration, and it began increasing um, several months before the accident. And within two to three weeks before the accident, it kind of crossed a threshold of that we would categorize as high level vibration. They continued to operate the unit even after it had crossed this. Они четыре дня попробовали, то включат, то выключат. А когда включат эти включают эти агрегаты, то вот ты сидишь в соседнем здании на стуле у тебя вот так тлесет. The vibrations were four times the permitted level of vibrations. The fact that it vibrates is not the problem. Every rotating machine vibrates. But when it begins to change over time, that is one of the major telltale signs of something else going on. And it was, it was actually documented that, that it was currently being investigated um, just before the failure. The increased vibrations from Unit 2 put high levels of stress on the 80 bolts that held the top cover in place. As the bolts weakened, they loosened and allowed the machine to vibrate even more, which in turn put the bolts under even more stress. This made the eventual failure inevitable. Laboratory tests of the debris from the accident suggested that many of the bolts from Unit 2 were heavily worn, and some had fatigue cracks. It's like if you have a thin piece of metal, if you bend it in your hands backwards and forwards, eventually it will break. Although the condition of the head cover bolt certainly contributed to the failure of Unit 2, it wasn't the only cause of the accident. In the wake of the catastrophe at Sayano Shushenskaya Hydro Power Station, many hydro experts attributed the cause to weakened bolts in the turbine cover that had never been replaced. Others said high-frequency vibrations, too subtle to be registered by the plant's outdated monitoring system, contributed to the equipment's instability. On the day of the failure, there were nine turbines running. Turbine six was shut down for maintenance, and turbine two was being used to take up the fluctuation in power demand. And a hydropower unit 
The unit most like it in the world are the other units at the same facility. And, and this unit was actually vibrating substantially more than the other nine. But yet it is the unit that they chose over the course of the night to put into regulation mode. So we had severe vibrations. We had them running the turbine into power output. Unit two itself went through the rough zone multiple times in the course of the night. It was up at full power and they were coming down, reducing the power down. Um, and they were just had entered into the rough zone region and were on their way down back through when the failure occurred. After the accident, the plant came under criticism with some reports questioning whether commercial pressure had influenced the operation of the plant. One of the, the things that this failure highlighted is that, that the machinery itself and the hydropower piece should be considered as part of the safety because the focus on the hydropower facility's safety has been on its dam. There is no design life to a dam. They're designed for infinite life. We inspect them, we take care of them, but the focus has been on the dam and less on the hydropower piece from a safety side. And as an industry, we began to look at a lot of those stationary parts. And in general, we tended to focus our fatigue analysis on more of the rotating parts and more of the parts that you would think would fail. Um, as a result of this failure, there was a really hard look around the world on um, looking at large bolts and large stationary bolts and inspecting them and, and doing ultrasonic inspections, looking for signs of cracks. Сегодня первым, на первом месте это безопасность. Вот, во-первых, изменения произошли. И там, в общем, все моменты были этой комиссии учтены. И я уже сказал, изменения в законодательство прошли, прошли изменения в уставы, прошли в должностные инструкции. Много лет громадные триллионы рублей ушли на то, чтобы восстановить I do not foresee another failure like this happening, but it is possible, it's theoretically possible, but all the signs were there. And there were months of data before this telling the vibration was increasing. If we learn the lessons of the past, and, and this should not happen, With reliance on fossil fuels becoming unsustainable, the demand for renewable sources of energy will continue to increase, and engineers must strive to improve the efficiency and safety of our production methods. The types of operating range that the power grid needs to keep the quality of the electrical power high, hydropower is in a unique spot to provide that type of service. The other types of power plants can't deliver the services that the grid needs. So we, we've developed a lot of different techniques just within the machinery itself to deal with operational challenges. Well, the future of hydropower is quite bright. <laughs>